On the day Titanic set sail, wealthy guests arrived with trunks, suitcases, and staff they couldn't do without. Getting on board was the ultimate status quo, and those who could afford a first-class ticket saw the ultimate extravagance. At the time of Titanic's voyage, it was common for full passenger lists of transatlantic ships be published in the local newspapers. Many of the passengers saw this as something to be proud of. The reception room would have been the first impression of the Titanic for many first-class passengers. When first-class passengers boarded Titanic, they were met by the chief steward and his staff, who escorted them to their staterooms. Each of the men were given a flower for their buttonholes. Around the corner from the reception room was the set of three first-class elevators. Most of the cabins were on the upper decks, away from the noise of the engines and near the dining room, grand staircase, and promenade. The most expensive rooms were connected to the first-class gangway entrances, enabling the copious amounts of luggage usually carried by the richest passengers to be loaded directly into their suites. First-class rooms ranged from suites the size of a ranch to a single-room berth with a shared bathroom. The type of first-class stateroom that predominated was a single or double berth stateroom which contained a dressing table, horsehair sofa, wardrobe, and marble-topped wash basin. Many also had additional bunks suspended over the main bed that could be folded against the wall. Staterooms increased in size thereafter, with double beds, built-in wardrobes, and comfortable seating areas. All first-class accommodations were equipped with telephones, heaters, a reading lamp, table fans, and call bells for summoning the steward. The 39 private suites were the finest on the ship. All had up to five different rooms. The suites included bedrooms, bathrooms, lounges, and extra rooms for servants. These expensive, exclusive staterooms boasted excellent fittings. Their cabins were complete with a fireplace, breakfast table, and posh lounge furniture. The most impressive were the four parlor suites. These comprised of two large bedrooms, two walk-in wardrobes, a private bathroom, and a spacious sitting room. The sitting rooms were lavish rooms that allowed for receiving small parties of guests. Each featured a faux fireplace, large card table, plush sofas and chairs, sideboards, and a writing desk. What made two of the parlor suites even more enviable was the large enclosed private promenade deck that was connected to the suite. These were unique to Titanic and were outfitted with wicker deck chairs, sofas, tables, and potted plants. These suites also came with an inside servant's room. Each suite cost a staggering $2,560 at the time. If the parlor suite didn't suffice, a wealthy family could purchase several first-class cabins adjacent to one another and open the interconnecting doors between the cabins to make a suite of their own. Many of the first-class cabins had interconnecting doors so that occupants could walk directly from one room to another. The first-class cabins had fresh flowers every day placed in the rooms along the mantelpiece by the maids. The suites had fresh white roses and pink carnations. The suites with a private promenade deck also received fresh poppies and daffodils at breakfast. One passenger recalled there were so many flowers on board, she said Titanic was a ship full of flowers. As was standard at the time, the bulk of first-class bathing facilities were shared. Communal lavatories could be found along the passageways divided by gender. Each passenger could take a bath by notifying a steward, who would draw the bath based on availability. Because of the need to conserve limited freshwater supplies, baths were supplied with seawater. Only the attached showers of the private bathrooms utilized fresh water. Also due to the limited fresh water supply on board, laundry was not offered. 
Instead, passengers could get their clothes pressed and shoes polished on request for a small fee. Still, the bed linen was changed daily. In the mornings, a steward would bring morning tea and pastries, but there was no room service in today's sense. So if a passenger wanted breakfast, they had to go to one of the ship's dining rooms. For breakfast, passengers could have chosen fruit, kidneys and bacon, oatmeal, lamb collops, smoked salmon, and a selection of rolls. Eggs and omelets were prepared for passengers specifically. For a member of the first class, mornings were spent in the ship's veranda cafe, or in the first class tea room, sipping tea and watching the ocean float by. The veranda cafe offered views of the ocean while being fully enclosed, allowing it to be enjoyed in all types of weather. First-class passengers could enjoy a selection of refreshments in the cafe. First-class children favored the veranda cafe and often went there to play together. Cafe Parisian was a trendy eating area on the Titanic, as it resembled the boutique cafes of Paris and was most popular among young adults. It had an environment with large windows overlooking the water. Café Parisien was open from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. and shared the same menu and servers as the a la carte restaurant. Just like the restaurant, it was privately managed and cost an additional fee. On Sunday, beginning at 10.30 a.m., the dining salon was used for the Anglican church service, which was conducted by the captain, or in his absence, a minister traveling in first class. The service was accompanied by a quintet, which included a piano. A day at sea could have been spent in many of the first-class facilities. The grand staircase served as the center of first-class activity. From the staircase, a passenger could access almost all the facilities available in first class. The smoking room was exclusive to men, as was the social convention of the time. It housed the only real fireplace on board. The others were installed with electric heaters. The smoking room was the preferred spot of gamblers who crossed the Atlantic. Cigars and drinks were provided by the stewards of the well-stocked adjacent bar upon request of the passengers. Passengers could sit on wicker chairs to finish their drinks. Others enjoyed walking around the room looking at the painted glass windows depicting many different ports from around the world, and other white starline ships. The bar stopped serving at 11.30 p.m., and the smoking room itself closed at midnight. The first-class lounge, a luxurious room located on the promenade A deck, was open daily between 8 a.m. and 11 p.m. This room was dedicated to reading, conversation, playing cards, and other social interactions of the day. The room was used primarily for socializing and the taking of tea, coffee, and a light refreshment before and after dinner. Here, first-class passengers could gossip, sit in silence, or simply lounge. Alcoves allowed passengers to talk to one another with a degree of privacy. The room provided a quiet haven, enabling passengers to meet, converse, or play card games like bridge. Others just enjoyed afternoon tea. From a small connecting bar, servers would provide tea, treats, and anything else that the passengers desired. They even had live music. A small orchestra, violinist, and a pianist would set the mood with everyone's favorite classics. The lounge included a wide mahogany bookcase that functioned as a lending library. They could choose from a collection of classics and the latest releases. It was available to all first-class passengers, but was predominantly used by females. Another largely female domain was the reading and writing room. It was a leisurely space for relaxation, reading, and writing home to family and friends. This room was designed for use by traveling first-class women. There was a huge bow window that enabled the occupiers to look out to the promenade deck, and a large fire that burned intensely, adding warmth to the room. Together, the promenade deck and the middle part of the boat deck constituted the outdoor space for first-class passengers. 
where they could enjoy the sea air and take exercise. Wrought iron benches on the aft end of the promenade allowed passengers to enjoy views of the stern and the sea. Folded deck chairs and steamer rugs were available to rent at the purser's office for four shillings, or a dollar each, which applied for the entire voyage. Stewards would bring broth and hot drinks for passengers if requested. Oftentimes, a passenger could spend the entire day relaxing and reading in their deck chair. The promenade deck was popular for playing games like shuffleboard, deck quats, dominoes, and chess, which could be obtained from the quartermaster. The Titanic featured numerous sporting and relaxation facilities. The first-class gymnasium was equipped with state-of-the-art exercise equipment, including two electric camels, an electric horse, a rowing machine, punching bag, a weightlifting machine, and mechanical bicycles. There was a permanent physical educator on staff who assisted passengers in using the devices. The gymnasium was segregated by gender and age. Unique to Titanic was the inclusion of a spa complex known as the Turkish Baths. Here, passengers could get massages, go for a relaxing dip in the saltwater pool, or just sit on the electrically heated bed to help their aches and pains. The Turkish bath suite had a steam room, hot room, cool room, electric bath, temperate room, and two shampoo rooms. Several service waiters were always there to assist the clients. The baths were segregated by sex, and there was a charge of one dollar per person for admission. In addition to the Turkish baths was a heated saltwater swimming pool across the corridor. Passengers could change in the dressing rooms and take showers in the stalls along the sides of the pool. The ship also featured a squash court for passengers up for a game. The squash court also had its own instructor on staff. For those just wanting to watch, there was a viewing section overlooking the court. To play, it cost 50 cents for half an hour. There was even a small barber shop that offered shampooing, shaving, and hairdressing services for one shilling, or about 25 cents each. The barber shop also offered small souvenirs and collectibles for purchase, including postcards, White Star branded trinkets, tobacco, dolls, pen knives, and hats. There was also no shortage of alcohol on board. The ship set sail stocked with 15,000 bottles of beer, 1,000 bottles of wine, and 850 bottles of liquor. As for the smoking room, there were reportedly 8,000 cigars. Tom Collins and Robert Burns were the best cocktails of the times, so of course, RMS Titanic had them. A Tom Collins is a gin-based drink with sparkling water garnished with a cherry or orange wedge. As for a Robert Burns, scotch whiskey, vermouth, absinthe, and bitters. The bars aboard Titanic opened at half eight in the morning and closed at 11.30 at night. They had two sets of musicians to entertain them, a five-man band led by Wallace Hartley, and a separate trio that played mainly in the reception room before dinner and later in the Café Parisian. Live entertainment was a major luxury on board. In 1912, people didn't have radios or any way of playing music during the day. Even in their own homes, they either had to make their own music or repeatedly crank the Victrola. Having access to a small orchestra that would play requests was quite special. First-class passengers had to stick to their own areas of the ship. Signs of notice would warn classes not to stray onto another's deck space, and barrier gates were commonplace. Few first-class passengers used the gym or the Turkish bath, but many of them sent and received marconigrams as wireless communication was still a novelty, especially at sea. Various games and sports were common on board liners on the Atlantic run. The daily sweepstakes, where passengers wagered against the distance traveled each day by the ship, was one form of gambling that nearly every passenger joined in at some point in the voyage. When six o'clock came, it was time for passengers to don their new gowns from Paris and arrive for dinner. Dinner was certainly an elegant affair, with the men in dinner suits and women wearing the latest fashions and imported exotic perfumes while showing off their finest jewelry. 
all while eating a feast fit for royalty. The reception room was open to passengers before and after meals. Before dinner, salon passengers could gather to discuss the day's activities aboard the ship. First-class passengers tended to linger with cocktails before going in for the meal itself. Some would sit on one of the many floral-patterned grandfather chairs to be found there. Here the orchestra played from 4 to 5 p.m. while tea was served. Then after dinner, from 8 to 9.15 p.m. Steward served liquor and cigars until 11 p.m., at which time the hall closed. Generally, there were many spectators in the room while the orchestra played. The reception room led directly to the dining room. On the Titanic, a seating chart for dinners was drafted that remained in place the length of the voyage, though passengers could make special requests with the purser at the beginning of the trip. The dining salon was open between 8 and 10 a.m. for breakfast, 1 and 2.30 p.m. for lunch, and 6 and 7.30 p.m. for dinner. Passengers could dine up to 8.15 at the latest, but only on request in advance to a steward. A bugle call to the tune of the roast beef of Old England was sounded half an hour in advance for lunch or dinner so that passengers could dress before a second call signaling the start of the meal. The first class luncheon menu was filled with delicacies such as roast beef, grilled mutton chops, and chicken a la Maryland. Seating 532 passengers at once it was the largest dining room ever seen on a ship. The saloon was arranged on the popular restaurant principle, with small tables seating two to twelve people. The large saloon had some recesses, as well as portable screens that would allow privacy for those parties that wanted it. Children could accompany their parents to dinner, unless the dining room was fully booked. Servants had their own maids and valley saloon on sea deck. In those days, dinner was considered a crucial part of a voyage. The ship's food was beyond gourmet. They were treated to a veritable feast at every meal. First-class passengers were served at least ten courses, with a diverse range of options, including a different wine served at each course. Selections included chicken, salmon, lamb, raw oysters, veal, roast duck, creamed carrots, and sirloin steaks. The meal was followed with fresh fruit, cheese, coffee, cigars, and port. Dinner at the ship's grand dining room was included in the ticket, but for the wealthiest on board who wanted to escape the lower tiers of the first class, they could dine in the ship's a la carte restaurant for an extra fee. The restaurant was the preferred alternative to the main dining saloon and gave passengers the option of enjoying lavish French haute cuisine at an additional cost. A passenger could choose to eat exclusively in the restaurant for the duration of the voyage and receive a three to five pound rebate on their ticket at the time of booking. Unlike the main dining saloon, the restaurant gave passengers the freedom to eat whenever they liked, between 8 a.m. and 11 p.m. The a la carte restaurant, as well as the Café Parisien, were owned and managed as a private concession of Luigi Gatti, an Italian immigrant to England and well-regarded London restaurateur. It provided the most intimate atmosphere on board. Half of the tables in the restaurant catered for two people, whereas very few of such tables were offered in the main dining saloon. Mrs. Walter Douglas, a first-class passenger who survived the sinking, gave her account of the a la carte restaurant. It was the last word of luxury. The tables were gray with pink roses and white daisies. The stringed orchestra playing music from Puccini and Tchaikovsky the food was superb, caviar, lobster, quail from Egypt, plover's eggs, hothouse grapes, and fresh peaches. Typically the evening didn't end with dinner. The men generally took to the smoking room, while the wives, who weren't allowed, headed to the lounge for a chat. First class on the Titanic was a whole new level of transatlantic travel. Life on the Titanic was a standard of luxury the world had never before seen on a ship. It is still the epitome of extravagance and class for people around the world. They called it the ship of dreams. And it was. It really was.